Why are we stressing ourselves, traveling around the world, preaching about marriage, if marriage was not that important? Marriage is very important. And whether you are not married at all, or you are presently married, or maybe you are looking at entering your second or even third marriage, it doesn't matter. Um, I need you to know marriage is important. Somehow, people don't give up on love. Everybody wants to find their true love. I've met 70-something-year-olds that tell me about finding true love. I said, okay. Because there's something in us that wants or needs to be loved. In fact, it started from God. Genesis chapter 2. After God made man, he said it is not good for the man to be alone. Hallelujah. Who made this statement? Who made this statement? I can't hear you, church. Who made this statement? And the who said? The Lord God said. So this was not a statement by uh, your popular podcaster. <laughs> this was not the statement of a popular talk show host. This was not the statement of a popular influencer. This is the Lord God. And he said, it is not good for man to be alone. If God said something is not good, then it's not good. It's not open to debate. You can't be smarter and wiser than God. Are you here, somebody? Everything, and please take note, you remember that everything God had said before this time, he said it was good. God made the stars say it was good. God made the, river, the ocean say it was good. God made the animals say it was good. God made everything say it was good. Then God made man. I looked at him. He said it's not good. For the first time, the almighty God looked at something he had made and said it's not good. Listen to me. If God says it's better that you have a marriage or relationship or companionship, trust me, it's better that you do. So we're going to look at the purposes of marriage today. Why, 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 why should people get married? Why should I get married? The late Miles Moreau said, if the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. People, because we don't, we don't discuss the purposes of marriage, people get married for the wrong reasons. I have a book here titled 25 Wrong Reasons People Enter Relationships. And I said in this book, if you enter for the wrong reasons, you most likely enter with the wrong person. If you are marrying for the wrong reason, you will likely marry the wrong person. If you are marrying because you just have a strong sexual urge, if that's the only reason you are getting married, then you'll be looking for a lady or a guy with sex appeal. The wrong reason will usually bring out the wrong person. So we must get to the purposes of marriage. There are seven purposes of marriage from scripture that I have seen. All of them, I use the letter C. I like to use things in sequence that way so that it's easy to remember. They're all letter C. Number one. Purpose of marriage is for us to complement each other. Complement with the E. Complement each other. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, it says, It's not good for man to be alone. Let's see what the Bible says. DJ, bring back the scripture. I called the people that put scripture on me, DJ, yeah? I'm sure you guys are used to that if you were here last year when I came. All right, so DJ Waxy. <laughs> <laughs> He said, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him what? And help meet for him. The expanded version of that verse says, I will make him a helper suitable and adaptable to him. In fact, another version says, I will make him a helper that will be complementary. Complementary. I wish you can find that version for me. I think it's either Amplified or AMPC or something like that. Complementary. If our one version says it's to balance him. Now listen, why, one of the reasons why God created marriage is for two people to balance each other and to complement each other. If man and woman are different. Pastor mentioned how that in Matthew 19, we, we, Jesus' response to marriage issues was go back to the design. Always go back to the design. There is a design. There is a template. He said from the beginning, it was not so. He said male and female made he them. 
In other words, God is saying, look, there is a design and there's a concept to the design. One of the reasons why you must get married is that as a person, you actually don't come complete. I know that, yes, we are complete in Christ. I get that. But actually in the design, you come with certain strengths and those strengths also mean certain weaknesses. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You come with certain strengths, but those strengths, if you are going to be really great at one thing, you actually become weak at another. That's just how life works. That's why there's no expert or champion um, basketballer that is also a champion uh, tennis player, that's also a champion soccer player. You, you can't. If you are great at soccer, it means you are going to suck at a lot of other things. Because you are in training for soccer every day. So you lose the, you know, like they say, focus creates blindness. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So God in his wisdom created us with certain strengths, but those strengths come with certain weaknesses. It's just like an issue, I'm a car enthusiast. Are there car people in this, this church? Are there people that love cars? I'm a car guy. So for a car to be a great SUV, there are certain features it must have. It must be high off the ground. So that it can, it can go over very high stuff. It usually has f big tires. It's usually very heavy. All these qualities make it a great SUV, but they make it a very horrible race car. A race car is opposite. A race car, the flatter it is, the better. You see? Then it, 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 it needs to be light. Most really good race cars have no space for luggage. Very light. Because if it's flat, it can make sharp bends. So what makes you solid in one area makes you very weak in another area. And God in his design said, if I bring these two people together, they now complement each other. This is why most times in relationships, opposites attract. Most people don't know this. Opposites attract. For us that are, um, do this professionally, we can usually guess the marriages that will succeed, the ones that will fail, or the ones that will struggle. It's very predictable to us from our own end. It's very predictable. I know to the people inside the relationship most times, they're always shocked. Some people are surprised that their marriage didn't work. Some are even surprised that their marriage worked. <laughs> like, oh, wow. I never expected this. <laughs> yes. Because for them, it was just a fluke. It was a gamble. But for us at the back end, we usually can predict. The stronger marriages are marriages where there are opposites. Not opposites in values, but opposites in personality. So they found out Talkers are attracted to listeners. Two talkers don't like each other. <laughs> Have you seen two talkers go on a date before? It's very tiring. The lady will come back and be like, that guy talks too much. He didn't even allow me to say anything. He will ask me a question and he will answer the question by himself. Two talkers don't like to go on a date. Same thing with two listeners. Two listeners too don't like to go on a date. It's very boring. Just sit down. How are you? I'm fine. How are me? We're well, fine. How are us? You like your juice? Do you like your juice? Juice? Because there's nothing to say. It's very boring. So usually opposites attract. You see, but most people don't notice. For every couple that is enjoying their marriage or they're doing well, I can show you how that they are opposite. That's why they are working. Organized people are attracted to scattered people. Two organized people can't live together. Organi Have you seen organized people? They know where they leave everything. They know where they want everything. If two people like that marry, they will clash on every single thing. Organized people, if you shift what they arrange, if you shift it by one inch, once they enter the room, they notice something has shifted. So they need to marry someone that doesn't care where the things are. In fact, most people, what you're complaining about in your marriage is the reason you are sent into the marriage in the first place. To compliment that person. So scattered people like organized people. Planners usually are attracted to spontaneous people. So, and if you're not careful, that attraction can also be a frustration if you don't understand that this is why you are sent to this person's life. That's why they adore you. What you are sent to Compliment is what you're complaining about. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Opposites usually attract. In fact, they found out one time that it's very common to see a moody person 
marry a jovial person. See, it's very common. They said it's also very rare to see two jovial people marry. It's rare. They said it's almost impossible to see two moody people marry. That it never happens. That moody people are just unhappy. They are not stupid. They are not stupid enough to marry each other. That's what they're trying to say. That moody people know are moody. They, they look for someone that will bring some ray of sunshine. Some brightness. Opposites attract. Two moody people can't see each other and say, mm, mm, I love you. Mm, I lo-. They are just unhappy. They are not stupid. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Opposites attract. Spenders marry savers. Mm. <laughs> These are the things that break some marriages because they don't understand that we are together because we can complement each other. I, I, I need a couple. Is there any couple in front here? I need a couple, a married couple that can volunteer themselves. If you don't mind, come. Come on the stage if you don't mind. A married couple, come. Come on the stage. Just come on the stage if you can find your way to the stage. Keep clapping for them as they come. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So, opposites generally would attract. And now, this opposites attracting can be sometimes personality types, like I've mentioned. Thank you. Just hold on a minute. You know? <laughs> Those opposites can sometimes be personality types. Sometimes um, it is gender differences. You know, that's why ideally, you know, men are attracted to women. At least, no matter how much we want to paint it, there will be more. Um, opposite sex, you know, marriages, no matter how much we want to do it, because that's just the natural order, all right? Like Pastor, Pastor Mike said, at the beginning, for the beginning, it was not so. Male and female made it them. So opposite generally will attract. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> Praise God. So opposites generally will attract. So even in terms of gender, in terms of gender, um, everything about us is opposite. Like I've mentioned before, uh, when I came here the last time, uh, that's why women are family-oriented, men are work-oriented. Men get their self-esteem and identity from work. Women get their esteem and identity from marriage. All right? It's not, it's not, it's not a big thing. It's just how God made it. The first thing God gave Adam was a, was a job. The first thing God gave Eve was a marriage. So um, women are always like marriage. That's why, if you do, that's why the link up was a big deal. Because I've, speak, I've spoken at many um, um, events that are for singles, and you have 99, sometimes 98% female. So, so what, what the crew and Pastor Mike and everybody leadership did was a big deal, trust me. Trust me. In a lot of those meetings, <laughs> only, in a lot of those meetings, only women come out. Because men, 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 men don't think, just wake up and think about marriage. They think about work. Let's make it. What they don't realize is that they actually need marriage more than they know. And I hope I'll have time to get into that. If you're a guy, marry, marry this year. <laughs> I'm telling you, you will thank me later. Marry as fast as you can. Trust me, if when I'm done today, hopefully you, you would understand that you are missing out on a lot. God says it's not good that you are alone. You don't function best. And this is what God said. It's not something you can, you can change. You, it's not something you can, you can use English words to change. God said for you, it is not good. You won't be at your best being alone. So a man and a woman are gifted differently. So from the original design, men are wired stronger and physical because the, their role involves that. Women are wired softer. A woman's body is about 10 or 20 times softer than a man's body because she's wired for a different role. She's generally more family friendly. She's a nurturer by nature. I know this world is trying to socialize women to compete with men. Listen, that's a waste of time because all the women that have tried to do that, at the end of the day, they find that they are not very fulfilled. Because science has shown, and I've said, I said it last time I came, I teach from both scripture, um, science, and statistics. So, any direction. Science has shown that. When a woman sees a baby, there are hormones that flow in her that are different from that of a man. A woman generally reacts to a baby. It doesn't matter. She doesn't have to be her baby. Any baby. baby. Because she is biologically wired to react so. When men see babies, they run. It's not mine. 
That's their reaction. Escape. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Women are wired for family. But the world is trying to tell them, compete with men. Compete with men. They found out. CNN released a report some years ago. They found a lot of the women that even make it high in the corporate ladder. All of them suffer from guilt. Mommy guilt. They all wish they stayed at home more. So, women love family. And I've preached in so many continents, so many countries. The, the reaction is the same every time you propose to a woman. Same thing. Once you propose, she'll go out of breath. Oh! It's a lie. <laughs> Everywhere in the world, women react the same to proposal. They are always happy. And women that don't even know her are happy. She just say, They will say, Woo! They don't even know her. Because a win for one woman is a win for all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everybody is happy. Every time there's a proposal. Hallelujah. So, they are wired differently. For instance, a man is wired visually. Everything about a man's life is about what he sees. If you're a man, your core purpose, core function in a marriage is vision. This, these are part of things that makes you attractive to a woman. You must be a person of vision. So you are wired with your eyes. Science has found that men can see better on a straight line. You are wired for vision. And they found that women can see better from the side of their eyes. Because she's wired for nurture. In, the ancient men were hunters, so they needed to be able to see the animals straight line far. But the Asian women were nurturers. So they could take your four kids. They could be looking straight and be seeing the four kids playing around. Their eyes can turn. Most guys don't know women can see from the side of their eyes. <laughs> and most women don't know that men can't see from the side of their eyes. I always tell men, every time you're sitting beside your wife or girlfriend, and you're on your phone, she's reading your chats. <laughs> most guys don't know. I can tell you for free. She's watching the TV with you, but she's reading your chats. Sorry. She can see from the corner of her eyes. Say, oh, he's going out by four. Hmm. Who are you going to see by four? She's watching the TV, but she's reading your chat. Most guys in, in an event like Link Up, they think they're the one that saw the babes first. The babes saw you first. <laughs> Two girls will be looking straight at the gossip of the guy here. Who was that guy wearing red? He's looking at us. Is he planning to come here? Like, she's looking straight, but she's talking about you. Because she can look without turning her face. Unfortunately for men, if a man is staring, everybody knows he's staring. <laughs> he has to stare. <laughs> because I and my wife are a bit popular, whenever we go to any big store like Walmart or, um, you know, um, Asda and all these things you have here, you know, and it's a big store and we enter the store and maybe some people enter that will know us, usually I can tell when the woman is talking about me. Because women recognize me first. So the woman will say, is that not Pastor? No, she's looking at the shelf, but she's talking about me. And because I know women can see from the corner of their eyes, I know she's talking about me. But to be sure, I wait for her to tell her husband. Because he can't see from the corner of his eyes. <laughs> so once she tells him, he's not passing, he has to turn. Let me check. I'll now wave. It's me. <laughs> he can't see from the corner of his eyes. If any married woman, if you have gossiped with your husband before, you know he spoils the gossip. The woman says, Look at that couple. Look at that couple. You tell your husband, Look at that couple. You say, Eh, hey, where? <laughs> and the more you tell him, Don't look. What's he going to do? He's going to look. <laughs> because he can't see from the corner of his eyes. So. The man comes with certain strengths. He's work-oriented. The woman comes with certain strengths. She's family-oriented. That together brings a balance. But when we start telling women to compete with men, so we have two work-oriented people in a home. And guess who pays the price? Family pays the price. Children pay the price. God wired it that way. Of course, sometimes there are exceptions. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But I'm saying principally. Men and women are wired differently. So let's, let's see this couple. Please come. Hallelujah. So, assuming their front side is their strengths and the back is their weaknesses, when they stand like this, they have strengths, but they also have weaknesses. When you're a man, when you're alone, step forward a bit. When you're single, you have so many strengths. They're here, but you also have weaknesses. Men are wired for vision. Women are wired for details. Women can. Women are incredible with details. Oh, that's why if you're a man, uh, you see, if you're a man, you, you are just, even if you, have, if you have done well for yourself, trust me, you will do greater. Because all you are doing now is you are running with just one side of the potentials that you have. Men are wired for vision. Men have binocular vision. They can see far. They can't see close. Because that's what the binoculars does. So you can see far. This is how men are. They can see far. They can't see close. They are made for vision. 
That's why in Joel chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost came, it only enhanced what we are both wired to do. He said, your young men shall see vision, your old men shall dream dreams. When it put women in the mix, your handmaiden and all that, he said, they shall prophesy. Because what's prophesy? The woman reminds you of all the vision. What God had said, she brings it back to you. My wife still tells me today that all the things we are doing today, I told her before we got married, that part of what I used to propose was join me, let's take over the world. She still reminded me last week. Because women have the capacity to prophesy. That's why women have a greater memory than men. You see, God did it that way. We, we, you, we, literally, there's nothing a man and woman has the same. Nothing. Everything about us is different. Skin type, hair type, texture, brain. Our brains function differently. A man's brain is wired for one thing at a time because he's a vision-oriented person. So he can do only one thing well at a time. He's not easily influenced. He's, that's why if you find out most men, if a woman, you, well, you tell your husband things for a long time before he agrees or changes because he's not wired to adapt. He's wired to stay focused. Women, on the other hand, are wired to be influenced. This is why things like social media pressure women more than the pressures men. Women are wired to be influenced because they are meant to follow a man and they need to be adaptable to follow a man. But again, the world is socializing women to stand on their own, be independent. We're just going to scatter more homes. So a man is generally aggressive, a woman is agreeable. The man's aggression is not against the woman, it's for the woman. It's to protect, it's to hunt, it's to fight, to provide. But if he's not well taught, he will use that aggression against her. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So a man can see better on a straight line. A woman is gifted with details. All my books started coming out once, once I got married. When it was just me, I just had the vision of the books. They were just visions. Once I got married, the visions began to materialize. Two are better than one. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So the man is wired for vision. Women, details. Details, incredible. De That's why for a woman, when you say blue, blue shoes. Men just need two shoes. One black, one brown. <laughs> or one black, one white. And they wear it with everything they have. For women, if you say blue shoes, women have so many blue. There's dark blue, sky blue, ocean blue, powder blue. Baby blue. And then there's high heels, there's open toe, there's <laughs> details. Pastor Mike, when I got married, that's when I found out that, you know, for men, we, men need only one soap. One bar soap. We'll have our bath with it, wash our clothes with it, wash our car with it. One bar soap. When I got married, I found out the, hair, the, the soap for washing hair for women is different from the one for face. It's different from the one for their body. They're different from the one for their clothes. And even their clothes, the one for underwear is different from the one for normal clothes. What? Then even after having their bath, the cream they rub after that, the one for hair is different from the one for face. Different from the one for hands. Different from the one for body. Men don't even need any cream. We don't even need cream. Is somebody telling what I'm saying? Women are so much into details. And for them, it's normal. They don't realize that we have zero capacity <laughs> for details. That's why if a man doesn't marry, there are aspects of his life that will be lopsided forever. He will never have that balance. There's a balance a woman brings. I said the last time I came here, Forbes found out that out of the 4,000 or so billionaires in the world, only 11% are women. Out of the 4,000 billionaires, only 11% are women. Out of the 11% are women, more than half, about 60% of those women inherited the billions. That is, they didn't make it. Out of the remaining 40% of that, I think about half of that, both inherited and worked for it. Only a small fraction worked from zero to billions as women. And that's a very good thing. Because women bring balance. Men keep working. They don't even know why they are working anymore. They say, I'm working for the family. But they've almost lost the family. By never being at home. But they say, I'm working for this family. He's not working for the family. He's just working instinctively. He doesn't even know why he's working anymore. Because it comes to him natural. But women understand that no matter how much you make, at a certain level of life, an extra 500 or 1,000 pounds will make a difference in your life. It's better to spend that time with family. It's better to spend that time looking beautiful, pampering yourself, going for a spa, taking a break. Women have to understand that. Going shopping. <laughs> 
But men don't have that balance. They just keep walking. They want to make the next 1,000 pounds. So there are more men that are billionaires. Women have a better balance. There's a level of life you get to. If you're already a millionaire, for instance, in pounds, an extra 1,000 pounds will make a difference to your lifestyle. In fact, an extra 10,000 pounds won't change your lifestyle. So women understand that. They'll go and do spa. But the men will say, let's make one more thousand pounds. Men see money as a price. Women see money as a tool. Men see money as something we need to get more of and keep. Women see money as something we need to spend. So women bring a balanced life. If a man not married, you'll be lopsided no matter how much you try. You love your dreams. Women multiply things. When the man is alone, his sperm just remains a seed. Once you bring a woman, that thing that is a seed becomes a child. A woman multiplies you. If you're a guy, I'm telling you, I kid you not. I'm a man's man. I said the last time I came, I'm a man's man. I, I used to have a pistol from when I was in high school. I used to smoke weed from far back when I was in high school. I'm born again now, guys. <clears throat> but I still have the gun. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> in case you still, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not that saved. I'm saved, but I'm not that saved. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking, you know. So, I'm a man's man. I ride motorcycles, um, drive fast cars. Fo- I'm a guy's guy. But... The moment I got, I thought I was good until I got married, I saw a whole new world. And my dreams became accelerated. Women are incubators. They don't only incubate babies, they incubate dreams. I'm telling you. Women are favor carriers. That's what the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. Of course, I'm talking about a good woman. So, don't go and marry a demon. And say, oh, my life was ruined by the No, no, no. When you pick right, this, because, because men are baseline people. Sometimes they don't, they don't want to focus on how, the kind of woman to pick. You need to learn about relationships. I have a book that I do, Who Should I Marry? I broke down the qualities to look out for in a wife. Because it matters who you pick. But if you marry the right woman, they said your life can never remain the same. She compliments you. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? There are so many things I can't say. But the important thing is that opposites generally will attract, either in temperament or in gender or in personality. So now, this guy has strengths here. He has weaknesses at the back. Stand, face that direction if you don't mind. Are you a pastor in this church? Are you a pastor? No. no. Okay, thank God. I can handle you anyhow. I like. okay. <laughs> Come this way, sweetheart. So back him, yes. So when two, say two shall become what? One. When they marry, this union now has no weaknesses. When he was alone, let's say he's good at making money but not good at managing it. She might be good at managing money. When he was alone, his strength was making money. His weakness was what? He couldn't manage money. When they marry, this union now has all strengths. This union can make money and this union can manage money. I told you last time I came, I, I, I make money easily. Making money is not a problem for me. Managing money, I, I spend faster than I make. But my wife is a saver. She's a champion saver. She has won some medals <laughs> in saving money. Oh, my wife doesn't spend anything. She'll price everything. You know savers, they price everything they don't buy. She's a saver. So before I got married, I never had money. I made money, never had money. When I got married, with her help, now I have money. So it appears that weakness has um, diminished or almost disappeared because of who I married. So this is what happens to when you marry. Both of you bring your strengths together. And usually, because you are opposites, usually, the areas of weakness you have, she has them as strengths. The area of weakness she has, he has them as strengths. And this union now has no weaknesses. But it doesn't stop there. I'll get there as I go on. Part of the second purpose of marriage is character development. What happens is that if he was bad at saving, and she's good at saving, when they marry long enough, he becomes better at saving. And she becomes better at spending. (laughs) Yes, I've taught my wife to spend now. (laughs) Glory to God. That's what happens. If he was uh, not good at talking and she's good at talking, by the time they get married for a long time, um, he becomes better at listening, she becomes better at talking. It's part of what God designed. (laughs) Oh, what's happening? Somebody is, who is the talker and who is the listener? This is why, for those of you that are married, if you, let's say you are the man, that you are the head doesn't mean you run everything. 
the head of this country doesn't represent the country in football. He can't say I'm the head. I'm the prime minister. Give me number nine. I must play for England. He doesn't do that. So, so you must both come together and say who is better at so and so thing. When it comes to family life, women are generally better. Because people ask me at the time, who should cook? First of all, biologically, food is attached to women. This is food. There's food in your destiny. Right here. They attach food to you and it's not detachable. Nature has implicated you. That is you God trusts with children. And even... And even scientifically, like I said, I'll give you science and everything. Even scientifically speaking, women find out the more they breastfeed, the more there's an attachment between mother and child. There's oxytocin and co-flowing. Men, though, are not wired that way. Not that, now, the areas where you are not good, you should learn. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying men are exempted from parenting or cooking. I'm just saying, naturally, one person comes stronger in certain things than the other. It's for the good of the team. It's not a competition. Is for us to complement each other. Let's clap for this couple. Thank you. Thank you. So, number one purpose of marriage is what? Complement each other. Second purpose of marriage is what I started. Character development. Listen, guys. If you think you are kind, wait till you marry. If you think you are patient, wait till you marry. You think you, are, you have courtesy, you have manners, you have good behavior. Wait till you marry. You know how to pick your words. You're a good communicator. Wait till you marry. Marriage will expose your bad character flaws and also expose your good ones. But the design of marriage is that it helps sharpen your behavior. You will never see the best version of yourself until you marry. It teaches you patience, teaches you how to manage your emotions. You learn it in marriage. That's why in Ephesians 5, in Ephesians 5, the Bible is clear there. It says, husbands, love your wife the way Christ loved the church. We develop Christ-like love only through marriage. It says, wife, learn to submit to your husband like you're submitting unto the Lord. You develop Christ-like submission or christ word submission. You learn it in marriage. Marriage shapes you. The biggest error the young generation is making today is thinking marriage is all about them. Why do you want to get married? I want to be happy. Marriage is not for your happiness. It's for your holiness. <laughs> marriage is not for your satisfaction. It's for your sanctification. It's not meant to make you happy. It's meant to make you better. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Character development. That is why, that is why, when you are even choosing who to marry, please, there are certain things to look out for. It makes the journey easier. I have a book here titled, Who Should I Marry? I listed the things. I discovered young, most of young people don't even know what to look out for and who to marry. Number one, if you're single, you're looking for who to marry, and you're a Christian, the first thing is let us see is Christ. Marry another Christian. It makes your journey easy. Marry another Christian. You guys are already in agreement on a lot of basic things. Marry another Christian. The Bible is clear. You can't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. If you're a born-again Christian, the Bible dictates that you marry another born-again Christian. Because there's no way you can build real, total intimacy if you are a spiritual being and you're marrying someone that doesn't even exist spiritually yet. Something is always going to be missing. So number one, marry someone in Christ. The Bible is clear about that. Especially if you have been an unbeliever before and now you're a believer, you should be able to tell there's a big difference between being a Christian and being one that is not. Before I became born again, I wanted to kill people. Like I said, I had a pistol. <laughs> if I ever had those kind of things, you're looking for who to use it on. So my desire was to kill. The moment I became born again, now my desire is to save. Very important. When I was not born again, I was a thief. <laughs> stole everything stealable. I stole so much from my dad. I stole so much from my dad. I mean, my dad, we, it became a cat and mouse game without officially stating it. 
You know, when your dad is saying, I want to see if you can find this one, he'll hide it somewhere else. And I'll find it. He'll hide money here. I'll find it. Sometimes when I go to school, I come back from school and I meet some people in the house. I ask them, Is there money in this house? They say, They've searched everywhere. No money. I'll say, Give me a minute. I'll enter the room and I'll come out with money. They say, How did you find it? Because I had that kind of mind. One time, my dad hid money in a bag, hid the bag, locked the bag, hid the keys to the bag, <laughs> all in different places. And I found all of them. I found the bag, found the keys, found the money in the, hidden in the bag. After I stole that one, my dad came. He said, you're a smart boy. He said, I'll send you abroad to study. You are smart, you'll make it. That's how good I was as a thief. <laughs> so hold your purses. Close. But when I became born again, now I'm a giver. I love to give. I love to give. <laughs> I, my wife's goal is to give a million dollars. At, at once, as one seed. Yes. I'm a giver. Our last, uh, we, we, we set targets in giving. Maybe some other time we'll come, we'll talk about money. Because, again, uh, money can strain marriages, so every couple needs to get that area covered. One of our last goal was that we gave $100,000 in cash, one seed. That was our last major seed. So the next goal we have is to give a million dollars. I know that's not big money here, so... You guys look rich. <laughs> but we, we also have, we have financial goals. So I'm a giver now. I was so obsessed with taking before. Now I'm obsessed with giving. What am I saying? When you become born again, Christ changes the trajectory of your life. You move from being that slutty, wild, crazy girl to being a conservative, godly, Bible-talking, tongue-talking, Bible-carrying, church-attending, hallelujah, shouting, Woman of God. It is a big change. Are you here, somebody? So, number one, marry someone in Christ. Number two, marry someone that has character, godly character. Because not everyone in Christ, or not everyone that is in church that is in Christ. Are you here, somebody? A church is like a hospital. Everybody's welcome in church. So, just because you met them in church, doesn't mean you should marry them. Yes, they might be in church and not be in Christ. Sleeping in a garage doesn't make you a car. <laughs> so that they come to church doesn't mean they have Christ in their lives. So look out for character, godly character. Are you here, somebody? That Christ-like character. If he's lying for you, he will lie to you. If he's cheating on God, he will cheat on you. Are you getting what I'm saying? Godly character is developed. So look out for that. That's second C. First C is the person must be in Christ. Second C, look out for character. It's difficult to change people's character. I can never forget Pastor Mike. One of the most touching stories of my ministry life is one of my guys that um, he, he used to be a gangster. In, in Nigeria, we call it campus cults. So he was a hitman. Everybody knows what a hitman is. He was a hitman for his campus cult. Great, the guy was like a giant, very huge. And he was a hitman, very dreaded guy. He was so good that they used to send him to different campuses to hit people. So that's what this guy was, a giant and a hitman in his, in his, in his gang. It's called, called cult with machets and things like that. Then he came to our service, one of our services, he now became born again. I mean, this guy totally transformed. He now became a gentle giant. This guy born again, tongue talking, tight pain, totally changed. The guy began to teach believers class, began to minister to other Christians, was one of our believers class teachers, totally changed. The guy used to pay tight weekly. I mean, sizable amounts. This guy used to come to church office to harass me and say, Pastor, you don't announce the needs of the church. We want to give. That's every pastor's dream. Because normally we harass people to give. They have a member harassing you that tell us what we can give for. That's every pastor's dream. Transformed life. Great guy. This guy was a pillar in the church. But guess what? While that was going on, there was another lady in our church. <sighs> she was a fighter. Her dad left early, so she got angry. A lot of times, trauma is speaking in people. See, some people fight you, are not fighting you, they are fighting their dad. It's not you, you just look like their dad. <laughs> so this guy, yeah. I have, a, I have a book here titled, Heal Before You Deal. A lot of times, you don't even know when trauma is speaking. Some people think it's their opinion. You know, it's just trauma. Just trauma. I don't have time to go into that today, but there's a book there, Heal Before You Deal, where we dealt with things like that. Now, this woman definitely was traumatized, but I didn't know that then. 
She used to fight her dad. She used to, because her dad left. She, she now she used to fight her mom. Then she fights her elder brother. Then she fights her boss. Then she even fights me, the pastor. So, and she was such a troublemaker. It was a small church. She was such a troublemaker, scattering the church, always fighting, always causing tension. And the church was too small. We just started ministry then. I said, we can't continue like this. So I called my associate pastor. I said, let's pray. We said, Lord, send this girl to Tab London. Send this girl to another church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just send this girl somewhere. I'm not kidding, but we, we, I didn't mention Tab London then, of course. So, <laughs> but we, we, we held hands. Me and my ship pastor said, Lord, send her to another church. And truly, like one or two months after she came and said, Pastor K, um, I'm feeling led to go to another church. And we're like, oh... Why? Are you sure? We're so happy. <laughs> people don't know pastors pray people out of church. We do. We do. We spend, do night vigils. Say, oh Lord, send Linda out of this church. Send her to another church. And if there's any pastor you don't like, you pray, Lord, send her to so and so's church. <laughs> so she left the church. And there was peace and prosperity in the land. Everything was going fine. But guess what? While that was going on, this pillar now fell in love with the caterpillar. <laughs> the pillar that was a changed guy, transformed life. I don't know where they met and started becoming friends and fell in love with the caterpillar. Oh, we tried to signal him. <laughs> you can't marry this girl. Ah. I told him, <laughs> told him by English language and sign language. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tried to discourage him. You can't marry this girl. But he was too far gone emotionally. That's part of what I covered in the book, Common Love Lies. They love love lies that can stop you finding true love. When you think your emotions are telling you the truth. Your emotions are not meant to give you direction. Your emotions are great foil, but they're not great GPS. Are you getting what I'm saying? <laughs> Marriage is not an emotional decision. It's a functional decision. That's why the marriages that are built on function always are last those that are built on emotion. Because emotions by the very design are not built to last. Emotions don't make sense. That's why you don't feel like going to work all the time. <laughs> but you know, in spite of how you feel, while you're still feeling, your body's in the bathroom. <laughs> getting ready for work. But your feeling is still on the bed saying, I don't want to go to work. Your, bo your body's going to the bus stop. <laughs> so you don't, you don't listen to your feelings. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So you must have to differentiate the two. Feelings are okay, but we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't respond to it. So this guy fell in love with this girl. Tried to stop him. He didn't stop. They got married. And uh, he married her back into church. <laughs> and she continued from where she stopped. <laughs> continued making trouble, continued fighting. After some months, she left again by herself. Then after some months after that, he too left. Because I'm sure he couldn't keep coming when the wife was not coming. I didn't see them for like four years. When I saw them after that, about four or five years, I saw him, rather, after that. He told me, Pastor K, he said that marriage failed from the beginning. That the only reason why it lasted for four or five years was because we were trying to prove you wrong. We didn't want it to look like you warned us and we did it and it didn't work. So we stayed together because we were trying to prove you wrong. That it had failed from day one. Because from when they were even dating, courtship, everything about his life began to go down. He stopped tithing. Business began to go down. Um, he went back to fighting. Because he will go and, she will go and make trouble somewhere. He will have to go and defend her. See, whoever you marry, you inherit all their assets and liabilities. That's what marriage is. Marriage is a covenant. So that's why you can't make that decision emotionally. You are inheriting all their assets and what? Liabilities. So he started fighting again. His life just generally started to deteriorate from when he married her. He said they fought so much that there's no way they went to that she didn't fight. If they went to a restaurant, she would fight the servers, fight the valet, fight everybody. That there are times he almost threw her from the balcony <laughs> because they fought every day. I kid you not. This is his own testimony. He was telling me. He said there are times they were driving on the highway, they would park their car, come down and fight. His own testimony. So he was telling me. They would come down and fight. After they fight, they would straighten their clothes, enter the car and continue the journey. She was a fighter from the beginning. Last time I heard of him, 
um, he, was, he was homeless. He was sleeping at a pub. I believe he, was, he should be better by now. But I'm saying, see how much his life changed. So, guys, you need to get married, yes. But please, marry the right kind of person. Don't get me wrong. But trust me, marrying the right person will totally transform your life. It's the best decision of my life. Getting my, I thought I was doing great. And, it, and it, I was doing okay then. But when I got married, things got accelerated. When two people complement, and when their character is developed, you learn how to care. You learn patience. You learn how to wait. There are some men, when they come to church, the way they leave their wife and just walk, they are not yet learning it. You learn how to listen. You learn how to do things even when you don't feel like. Marriage sharpens your character. Your Christ-like character might never be fully developed until you marry. You learn how to talk. You learn how to choose your words. You learn that you don't say everything you think. <laughs> Married men understand this. Because one man all the time, you have a right to remain silent. <laughs> For everything you say can be used against you. <laughs> Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You begin to learn. And if your wife doesn't, or husband doesn't train you enough, then God gives you kids. Those ones are the most selfish beings in the world. They don't care what you're going through. They need your attention. They need it now. So all that strains you. You begin to learn selflessness. Because as a human being, you are principally selfish. That's your, you are first thinking of yourself. Most people getting married and marrying for themselves. Only to enter marriage and find out it's not about me. So that selfishness dies in you. You now learn how to serve. You become more responsible. Are you here, somebody? So marriage generally, I think Hassani mentioned it when he came, how that married men prosper more financially. Because many men say, the reason I'm not married is that I've not gotten it together financially. That is the reason you should get married. That's not the reason not to marry. So I've not gotten my life together. A woman will get your life together in a hurry because she's a fixer. She's an organizer. Are you here, somebody? She would do it like this without thinking twice because she's gifted with all the strengths you don't have. So I have seven purposes of marriage. I've just done two. I'll do the other five in the next service. So if you can wait. <laughs> wait for that service or call someone or watch the video. But I'll teach the other five. I have seven and um, I don't have time to do all of it here. So number one, purpose of marriage is for two people to complement each other. Such a beautiful idea. Such a beautiful union. Hallelujah. Such a beautiful thing. You have a support. You have a, somebody that completes you. Somebody that complements you. The areas you are not strong, you find out the person is strong. The areas you are strong, you find out you need to help the person. If your spouse is scattered, you are the organizer. Organize their lives. If you're a, 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 a highly driven person, usually marry is a laid back person. So you are representing the family. Push the things. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says two are better than one. Were you blessed this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just pray? Glory to God. Lord, I thank you for every single person in the house. I pray that you open the eyes of the men to begin to see the blessing and the purposes of marriage. Give them wisdom. Give them clarity. Let their steps be ordered. I break that spirit of fear that is stopping them from taking the next step. Lord, open their eyes to find virtuous women. Women that will stand by them and support them. Thank you because you said in your word that he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. I pray for the young men in this house. This will be that year of favor for you. This will be that year of finding for you. In the name of Jesus, your steps will be ordered. I pray for the women that God will prepare you. God will polish you. God will garnish you. You will be every man's dream. You will be the kind of woman 
that men are praying for. God will give you wisdom. God will give you virtue. You'll be a blessing to whoever finds you. You'll be a favor carrier for whoever finds you in the name of Jesus. And for every married couple in the house, I pray that your union gets stronger. You will start to enjoy the real benefits of marriage in the name of Jesus. Your marriage will stand the test of time. And at the end of the day, your marriage will bring glory to the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big praise, Tab London. Tab London, make some noise for Pastor Kingsley. Come on, show him some love.